All right. So um, God, our father, is the art of storytelling. All right. Storytelling is not of this world. Okay. Um, storytelling is not of this world. It's of God. Storytelling is of God. The, 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 our father is the, he is the found thing of storytelling. You know, if you, if you look at the scriptures, you would see how that um, with the children of Israel, with the children of Israel, you know, God, you know, um, taught them the important spiritual import, you know, the spiritual import of, you know, transmitting the operations of God amongst them, transmitting the expressions of, you know, the activities of angels, you know, the operations of miracles, you see, that were rough or walked amongst them, transmitting it to the next generation via storytelling. You see, it was one of the reasons why at different points that Israel came to, you know, the father would instruct them to leave a monument, all right, to leave a monument, all right, so that, like the scripture would say, say so that when your children ask you in the days to come, what meant this? What meant this? So see, through storytelling, the father taught them storytelling. Through storytelling, um, they were able to um, not just, you know, uh, pass on, you know, information. And no, 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 no. What they were passing on is not just um, amusement, you know, not just excitement, not just, you know, information about, you know, their ancestry. No, what they were passing on is the divine interactions with God. You see, the divine interactions with God. Now, I'm sure you remember that um, when um, Moses, all right, had come to the children of Israel, you see, when he had come to the children of Israel, now, before he did come to them, the Bible tells us that um, when, you know, the, the Lord was, you know, bringing him into divine experiences, all right, on Mount Sinai, the scripture says that, he asked God, so what's your name? What will I tell the people is your name? Because they will ask me, what's the name of this God? You know, what's the name of this God? Now, isn't it interesting that the generation of the children of Israel to whom Moses was sent didn't even know the name of the God of their father, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't know the God, the name of the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So much so that Moses needed to reintroduce him you see Moses needed to reintroduce him you see they had been they had been so much uh, they had been so enslaved they had been so enslaved you see that that you know the 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 the, the knowledge that they were supposed they were supposed to have of the you know the um, divine interactions of their fathers, which ought to become their heritage, had been vanquished from their hearts, had been, you know, broken off and, you know, taken away from them, you know, taken away from them. So much so that when Moses came, Moses needed to introduce God to them, needed to tell them who God was, you know, the gods of their fathers, the God of their fathers rather, needed to talk to them, you know. So, you know, they listened to Moses, with um, with an awe, you know, the awe of someone hearing something for the first time. <laughs> you see, you know, that level of slavery was was terrible, was terrible. Now, so with that generation, you know, to whom Moses was sent to, you know, as God began to walk amongst them, as they left the land of Egypt, you know, to come into um, um, Canaan, you see, the, the different divine occurrences that played out, you know, all right, amongst them, the father demanded that these occurrences be preserved, you see, and the kingdom principle, the kingdom process for preserving these divine occurrences is what we call storytelling. So storytelling is not of this world. Storytelling 
is of God. It is divine. It is divine. It is not satanic. It is not, um, um, it is not um, um, ordinary, all right? It is supernatural, supernatural. As a matter of fact, you see Jesus do the same, all right? In what we call the gospels, all right? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus tell stories. You see, tell stories to transmit principles of the kingdom, to transmit principles of the operations of the kingdom. You see, it's important, you know, at this point, let me say this, it's important parents, parents go back to true divine kingdom storytelling. Parents have stopped telling their children stories. Parents have relegated the, their responsibility to storytelling to 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 um 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 to marvel to um what's the name of these um these people who are into <laughs> you know um um the production of tom and jerry you know um 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 um, um you know with par christian parents kingdom parents you know disney world thank you disney world Parents have relegated their responsibility, all right, to storytelling, to Disney World, to, you know, name it, you know, all kinds of, you know, it's your responsibility. Hello, it's your responsibility. You should sit down. If you, you know, <laughs> you know, I was ministering somewhere, you know, and I said, if you know you're not ready for these things, don't get married. Don't get married. Some say, you know, you know, I have a lot of work. I need... Then don't get married. Wait until you are ready. <laughs> so I say, no, I'm ready. What? How do you know you're ready? Oh, because you're 32, because you're 35, or oh, because you're 28, or oh, because you're 40. You're not ready. If you're not ready to do these things, you're not ready to get married. And keep working, you know, since you, you're a busy man. Hello? <laughs> keep working. Keep working until you know that now you will have time. You see, for, of course, the woman you marry, then for the children you are going to have until you know. But see, a lot of people are not ready, though they think they are because, you know, of age. They think they are because, you know, the pressure from parents. They think they are because of the, you know, sexual feelings that they are feeling. So they do not want to commit adultery. They don't want to commit fornication, rather. So what do they do? Say, okay, let me get married so that I don't come. No! That's not why you get married. You don't get married because, you know, you don't get married so that you don't come in fornication. That's not why you get married. That's not why you, at least there are people in the scriptures who didn't get married. You don't get, that's not why you get married. So, that, you know, we preach those things in our meetings, you know, you know, when, when a couple are trying to be joined together, you know, we begin to give them a list for, for marriage. He says, so, you know, for, for procreation, for, 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 you know, for, to prevent Fornication. No, that's not why you get married. Those are not the reasons for marriage. Those are not the reasons for marriage. Those are not the reasons for marriage. Marriage is not God's, you know, um, 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 mechanism put in place to prevent sin. That's not marriage. All right. We need to understand as believers. All right. If marriage is a system, you know, an institution God has put in place to prevent sin, then Jesus died in vain. Hello, are you listening to me? Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. All right. Good, day, good morning, wherever you're listening from. Good morning. All right. So it's important we understand this. If marriage, all right, we should stop, stop telling people those lies. You know, if marriage is instituted or was instituted by God to prevent sin, then Jesus died in vain. His death was in vain. Was in vain. So that those are not the reasons for marriage. Oh, so that you don't, you don't sin. So that you don't, no, those are not the reasons. So that you can procreate. No, those are not the reasons for marriage. The reasons are clearly stated in scriptures. You know, but you know, over time we, we have a tradition of seeing what the scripture says, then we add to what scripture says. 
we add to it and we think, you know, as long as it makes sense, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, so if as a parent, as a young man, as a young woman, you will not have time, you see, to see to these things where in this context, you know, raising children, all right, is concerned, then don't get married. That's why we've had children. We've had children raised, raised in a sense, in a sense, like the children of Israel who do not know the God of their fathers. Now we think they knew because we're taking them to Christian meetings, taking them to Christian assemblies. You see, we think they know, you know, that's why I see some parents, when their children behave terribly, they usually respond in shock, in shock. They say, oh, this child, this child has killed me. <laughs> they will scream, hey, hey, John Boo <laughs> has killed me. <laughs> what will I, hey, this child wants to disgrace me. Eh? Me a deacon. Eh? Me a reverend. Well, what do you want you people to begin to think of me? <laughs> you see, you see the problem? It's about what the people will think of you. All right. All the while you were abandoning your responsibility towards the child. You didn't think of what heaven was thinking of you. You, you see the problem? You didn't think of what heaven was thinking of you. It is what people will think of you, what people will say that Reverend, Reverend, Reverend Dr. John Boo's daughter, you understand? Uh, or Reverend John Boo's son, you know, or Bishop Oyelowo, his son. So he said, you want, you, 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 you want to disgrace me? You want to disgrace me? Now, all right, um, for another day. But what we are saying is, we see from scriptures how God gave the responsibility, listen carefully, how he gave the responsibility of using the kingdom principle of storytelling to transmit or to facilitate impartations of the divine workings of God. You see, if you look at the scriptures, you will see that it was the whole of the children of Israel that God gave that responsibility to. God was speaking to every one of them. So God did not give that responsibility, listen carefully, the father did not give that responsibility to the priest. To the priest, you know? No, he gave that responsibility, he spoke that instruction. He spoke that commandment into the hearing of everyone present, everyone. See, that's the reason why Gideon, Gideon, you know, could say to that angel, when the angel said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon says to the angel, if the Lord be with us, where are the miracles? Our fathers. He didn't say where are the miracles? Our priests, fathers told us of. You see, where are the miracles? Our fathers told us of. Now, one of the reasons why I'm having to state this is, is you see, one of the reasons why, you know, um, One of the reasons why, you know, this is important, all right, a number of reasons, but one of them is, you see, your experiences in God are important. Your experiences in God are important, you see. And as a parent, you see, as a parent, now that's those, all right, um, um, parents whose children are still below the age of accountability. All right, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to transmit these divine experiences to your children. You see, you have a responsibility to transmit. It's one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons, all right, for, you know, experiences that we have in the water, by the water, by the spirit of God, all right? is so that for you as a parent, you as a parent, all right, it is one of the ways you trigger, you see, it's one of the ways you trigger, you know, 
desires in your children for divine things. It's one of the ways that, you know, through the story, the art of storytelling, all right, you, um, you um, create an environment, all right, in which the gates of your child's heart, all right, become invaded by the realities of the kingdom. You see, that primary responsibility is not for the Sunday school teachers in church, is not for the children Bible teachers, you know, in your local assembly or in your fellowship meetings. No, it is primarily yours. It is primarily yours. It is primarily yours. You see, it's primarily yours. You are stewarded with the responsibility. In fact, you are saddled with the you are the one saddled with the responsibility, you see, of transmitting the operations of the kingdom, all right, in the ways that they have played out in your life, all right, in the ways that you have experienced them, all right. Of course, using scripture as a foundation, then your life as an extension, your life as an extension. All right, of the supernatural in scriptures, your life ought to be an extension, you see, of the divine events and you know encounters and experiences in scriptures. All right, using your life as an extension to transmit, to transmit. Now you see the world, the world today are doing that. You see, many of the cartoons, you see, children watch today, they are stories, stories built in falsehood, stories, you know stories entrenched in the cultural religious beliefs of certain places, certain regions. You see, they are selling the cultures. Now, nothing is wrong with, you know, children becoming exposed to the different cultures of the world, you see, but everything is wrong with when stories being used, all right, to bring the minds of children, all right, into the into the religious, you know, twisted belief systems, you see, of the cultures of the nations. Now, so it isn't just an introduction into cultures, all right? No, that is just a decoy, that's a front, all right? The true attempt is to bring them into the world, you see, into the labyrinth, you see, of religious falsehood, you know, satanic demonic you know operations entrenched in the cultures of today one of it is a story a cartoon now listen just in case you want to get angry all right get a tissue so you can get angry one of them is a popular story popular cartoon series called avatar oh yes you heard me avatar the cartoon series you see if you look at it very carefully you see the number one, the number one, but see, it is sold underneath, you know, all the fun and adventure, all the technology, all the, you know, perfect pictorial presentation, all right? Hidden underneath it, all right, what they are selling is reincarnation. You see, reincarnation, which is an affront. Reincarnation at best, at its best, is an affront against the incarnation of God. You see, it's against the incarnation of God, all right, in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we understand that different cultures today have, you know, beliefs, all right, of reincarnation, all right? For example, it's in the Yoruba culture in Nigeria. It's in it's a different cultures in Kenya. You know, it's, it's all over, you see. But, you know, what we see in Avatar is the selling, is the selling, that is the number one product that is being sold, reincarnation. Okay. But of course, you don't blame these guys. You don't blame these guys, all right? It's their money. It's their money. They are using their money to sell. So what, what's, what's the church supposed to do? What's the church, all right, supposed to do with its money? All right. Hello. You see, what's the church supposed to do with its money? The church has money. <laughs> or should I put it this way? All right. Our churches <laughs> have money. Our churches, you know, have money. All right. 
<laughs> you know, some of this information available on the internet. You see the 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 you know the things we build, the, the things we 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 put money into, or I'm not saying they are wrong, but I'm saying those are proofs that there is money in the church. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so so a lot of times when the church hears these things we say oh but we don't have the money because look at that movie they said it cost how many millions of dollars there is such money in the church there is such money but the question is all right what are we doing with ours so you can't blame these people all right we can't blame these people all right what are we doing with ours all right so now so what, what back to what i was saying now what i was saying is um Now that that's a responsibility every every young man every young woman right must you know uh, understand you see you must understand you 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 have to be able to take into consideration the fact that you know of the many things that are important that are going to be your responsibility as a parent this is one of them <laughs> this is one of them you see this, this is one of the reasons why, as a young man and as a young woman, you need to create your own stories. I don't mean become a liar. No. Create your own stories. Plug yourself into the ecosystem, into the civilization of the kingdom. You see? All right. Until you break into experiences. All right. Until you break into experiences. You see? That become a personal extension of the scriptures. A, an extension of the, you know, of the supernatural operations of God in the scripture. Your life becomes an extension of that, that you will now what? Transmit, you will transmit. You, you, you are expected to tell your children stories of divine leadings, stories of divine guidance, stories of divine protections, divine preservations. Tell them stories, stories you know, of encounters, of, of, of operations, of the anointing, of, of the glory in your life. Tell them stories. You see, tell them stories. Your children don't know Peter. They don't know Peter. You see, that's why you see, you see a lot of our children don't watch, they don't watch all the cartoon anymore. They don't watch the Peter, you know, Jesus story. They don't, they don't know Jesus. You say, no, what are you saying? Yes, they don't know him. They have to grow up, you know. The way children come to know Jesus, all right, is, is, in connection to you know what they see in the home what they see in the local assembly all right children you see is in connection to what they see children don't know elijah they don't know what they don't know what it is you're telling them of how god fed elijah with ravens they don't understand that but your children will be able to know elijah and the stories of how he was fed by ravens, all right, through your own life. You see, the issuance, you know, the overflow of eternal fountains in your own life, through your own life, will cause stories in the Bible to make sense to them. It will cause stories. It will help stories in the Bible, in the scriptures, to make sense to them. To make sense to them. See, that's why you, you, you put Jesus' movie for your children. They're watching but the moment you go off, they take the remote and change it. Change it. You know. <laughs> I remember years back, years back, you know, <laughs> went to, I went to a certain, a certain, you know, a minister's house, you know, and, and you know, seated in the sitting room and the children were, they were frowning. You know, they were showing one, you know, story of, um, one Bible story. They were frowning, you know, just one was smiling and, you know, but these two, frowning. So the dad, you know, and the mom, you know, were trying to, you know, get some things for me to, you know, you know, to, 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 for me to, you know, be refreshed. So they went into the kitchen and the dad quickly went out to get something, you know. So I said to the eldest, you know, why are you frowning? He did the answer. It was the second one. I said, we don't want the movie. <laughs> I said, okay, which one? <laughs> what do you want? The man I asked, what do you want? Their, faith, their faces lit up <laughs> as though they are seeing God. <laughs> What do you want? It's little. And they were telling me, oh, put this one, put this one, put it. And the movies I put were not, you know, in that sense, in quote, Christian movies. And they were, I changed it for them. <laughs> I changed it for them. And they we're watching, you know, 
So the dad came in and was like, you know, what, what changed? You know, you know, maybe I was trying to put up an act because I was present in the house. <laughs> and I said, I did, I did, I did. Like, eh, okay, eh, eh, but these movies are not good. <laughs> I said, sir, <laughs> when I'm not here, which one do your children watch? <laughs> Which, which one do they watch? <laughs> Is it not these ones they watch? It's obvious they don't watch this, this other one. They are frowning. So don't feel embarrassed that, oh, they like this and I'm here. No. The point is, you know what the problem is, all right? You know what the solution is, all right? Don't, don't slam them. Let them watch it. Let them watch it. But you see, after this, beyond this, get to work. You know the solutions. Get to work. Get to work. Have time for your children. Not just to check their school, their school work. No, besides that, beyond that. Not just to take them out to, 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 to eat ice cream and, you know, you know. No, sit down with your children, sir. Sit down with them. Sit down with them. Don't force them. Don't force them. Don't choke, choke them with scriptures. They will learn scriptures better when they see it play out. You see, that's what happened. Many of us grew up with scriptural knowledge that didn't help us. You understand? It didn't help us. Children will learn scriptures better when they see it play out. When they see it play out. When they see it play out. You know? They will learn scriptures better when they see play out as stories. Stories. You talked about the power of God. Oh, how God provided for the children of Israel. How prophet Elisha prophesied by this time tomorrow. Let your children see stories of divine provision play out in the home. Let them see it. Let them see it. You see, you tell your children of how Jesus healed the sick. Let them see it play out in your home. It's one of the reasons why as a child, as a parent, you must be able to take your children to meetings. Bring them to meetings. You know, where the supernatural of God, power of God is displayed. Or you take your children out when you go minister to the sick. We've said these things many times to parents. Take them out. Take them out. Let them see what it's like to cast out devils. Let your babies, your babies, see it. Don't say no, let, let the babies. Go, go, go back and meet your mommy at home. No, let them follow you. And you wanted to have children now. And, and you like children. You like plenty. Mm? You like plenty. There are seven. Carry them. <laughs> who gave them? Who gave it to them? It's you. Carry them. Say there, there are too many. <laughs> Carry the children, my friend. Eh? You gave it to nine. Carry all of them. Take them there. Let them see what it's like to cast out devils. Say Jesus. Jesus, you know, cast out devils from the madman of Gadara. They don't even know what gather. Gather what? It says gather. <laughs> All right. All right. Glory to God. Glory, 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 glory to Jesus. Glory. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, someone is asking, all right? Someone is asking, um, he said, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. All right, good question. From, from okay, it's from First Corinthians 7, actually. But the question is, okay, you know, can you throw more light um, with the above scripture? Now, uh, in chapter seven of First Corinthians, all right, Apostle Paul, very quickly, we'll do this very quickly so we can, you know, <laughs> come to the, you know, Paul was dealing with the issue of, uh, of the unmarried and the married, okay? It was, because, you know, um, the book of First Corinthians in particular was basically um, um, a letter Paul wrote, all right, with a view to addressing different issues all right, that they had them um, for which they had, you know, written to Paul or sought Paul's counsel. Different. That's why you notice from chapter one, he was dealing with issues. Chapter one, chapter two, he was dealing with issues of division amongst the brethren. All right. In chapter five and six, he was dealing with the issue of, um, you know, fornication, you know, so he was dealing with issues. 
all right, in chapter seven, which is this, all right, he dealt with this issue we're going to talk about now. In chapter 11, he was dealing with issues of submission. He wasn't dealing with the issue of covering of the head. He was dealing with each, the issue of submission. That is why, if you notice, his focus in chapter 11 was covering of the head, not covering of the hair. All right. So in the first part of chapter 11, he dealt with the issue of what submission is submission in marriage, submission in marriage. All right. Then the other part of chapter 11, he dealt with the issue of what, how the people were, you know, behaving badly whenever they came together to break bread, you know, right? To partake, partake in what you, in the breaking of bread and in the, you know, in the wine. All right. He dealt with the issue. Then in chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, he dealt with the issue of order. All right. In, in regards to the manifestations of the gifts. He dealt with the issue of order, all right? First Corinthians 12, 13, 14, issue of order, all right? He dealt with the issue of order, all right? Where the operation of the gifts or the manifestation of the spirit, all right, is concerned, okay? In chapter 15, he dealt with, you know, false belief systems, all right, all right? Coming at the saints in regards to resurrection, in regards to immortality. You see, so it, it was basically a book for, you know, in which Paul dealt with issues. So in chapter seven, he was addressing the issue of, you know, the married and the unmarried. You see, so it was in that context, all right, keep that in view. It was in, within that context, all right, that this scripture, you know, was highlighted. Now, this scripture was highlighted when he had begun to talk about the choices anyone may have made, or the choice, rather, anyone may have made. All right, to be single, to want to serve the Lord, all right, but to want to serve the Lord by being single, you know, a person has made a choice or made a decision to be single, all right. Now, Paul says, if he has made, now I'm paraphrasing now, compressing the scriptures, if such a person has made that decision to be single, now, if later, you see, later he chooses to change his mind. He chooses to say, okay, you know what? Um, I want to marry. See, I want to marry because you understand. Now, listen, I want to marry because, because that's the word, if he bonds. I want to marry because, you see, uh, you understand, I can't be single anymore as it relates to my urges, all right? As it relates to my urges. Now, Paul says, if he bonds, all right, if he cannot contain, if he cannot contain, all right? He said, let him marry, for it is better to marry than to born. Now, listen, listen, this is the context. This is the context. Paul wasn't saying, Paul wasn't saying that that is the purpose of marriage. Okay? Paul wasn't saying the purpose of marriage is to marry than to born. No. He was speaking in direct relation to decisions some persons may have made to be single, all right? If they now eventually in the later years rescind their decision, change their minds, all right? He said, all right? He says, they should go ahead and marry. Say, for it is better to marry than to born. So he, this statement was made in specific relation to this issue. This is not a statement made, all right? as the basis for marriage. <laughs> you see? So we don't marry because we born. That's not why we marry. You know, born, that means to, 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 to have orgies that you can't call. That's not why we marry. That's not why we marry. All right? If you read that scripture very carefully, he's speaking of someone, all right, who has made his mind to be single, maybe at a point has, you know, taken, you know, made his mind or taking decisions to be a, a, a celibate, all right? And says, okay, I, I want to serve God by being single. I want to be single and serve God. I don't want to have anything to do with marriage, all right? So Paul didn't make this statement, all right, as a fundamental, foundational statement, all right, for why marriage happens. He made this statement in direct connection to these persons, these such individuals. Okay. So it's important that you understand that. All right. So it's not a scripture that speaks about the purpose of marriage. All right. It's a scripture that speaks into the heart. All right. Of these kinds of decision. 
that some persons have made in the Corinthian church and some persons are making today. Okay, so when he refinalizes by saying, let him marry, all right, he said, for it is better rather to marry than to born. It's not a statement that speaks generally about the purpose of marriage. It's a, very, a scripture that speaks specifically. It speaks in specific relation, all right, to, you know, decisions. Someone, all right, some persons have made or may have made. Okay. So the purpose of marriage is not so that you do not bond. That's not the purpose of marriage. That's not the purpose of marriage. Now, some persons think so, all right? And that's why some people, they get married and, you know, they are, they are, all right. You know, there are matters in relationships that, um, you know, in marriages, you know, you hear as a minister that, you know, but see, some persons have gotten married and, you know, have insatiable sexual desires. I'm telling you, insatiable sexual desire. Some persons have married with, ins I'm telling you, believers, you know, that their insatiable sexual desire is one of the problems in the marriage. But he's thinking, or she's thinking, am I not married? You know, should, you see, you know, to married couples will tell them, your wife does not exist for the purpose of your sexual satisfaction. Neither does your husband exist for the purpose, all right, of your sexual satisfaction. You see, your wife has a greater purpose in the marriage than that, than that. Your husband has a greater purpose than that. Oh, I'm telling you, over the years in ministry for me, all right, there are stories, you know, experiences where we've had to cast out the spirit of lust from husbands, from husbands. You know, husbands that can't see the nakedness of their wives, they cannot see it. Once they see, every time they see it, you know, every time they see it, their body, you know, <laughs> in closer, we call it their ministry man, begins to sing another song. Every, they cannot see it. That's a problem. That is a problem. It's a problem. There are women that their wives cannot, their husband cannot touch them. It's a problem. But you see, because it's in, in marriage, you think, oh, no, no, it's not. All right. Now, married couples who probably have been in such meetings, you know, have heard us explain these things. You know, I've heard us explain these things, you know. Uh, okay. Um, Okay. All right, so let's come back to the subject, all right? Angels, glory to God. Now, um, it's, it's important now from last, our last um, session, all right, we we're talking about the role that angels play when it comes to um, when it comes to the believer's work, all right? How that angels are an important, you know, um, instrumentality with which the father, you know, uh, um, 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 you know, brings instruction, you know, brings um, 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 guidance, you know, um, leadings to the believer. Now, it's, it's important that believers understand this. It's important that as believers, we understand this. Of course, we understand that the scripture says, these are by the spirit. Yes, but it's also important that you understand that the spirit of God, all right, the spirit of God oversees, oversees this. In other words, all right, he can, the Spirit of God, the Father can, all right, speak to us, can speak his instructions to us via the ministries of angels. It's important, all right, that the Father can speak to us. Can, now, the scripture is, you know, full of this, all right, 
So just in case you're wondering, okay, so let's just stick with the New Testament to begin with, all right? In the New Testament, all right, we see believers, believers, all right, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We see believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Indwelt by the Holy Spirit, all right? Receiving instructions from God through the ministries of angels. Angels spoke to saints in the book of Acts, brought instructions, brought words of comfort. You see, brought words of comfort. Now, you see, um, there are certain purposes of God. There are certain counsel of the Father. For your life, the Father will only communicate to you through angels. It's important you understand that. You see, why he does that, we don't know, all right? It, it's, it is at his prerogative. You see, it is at his prerogative. You see, and how the kingdom runs, all right, revolves around him. You see, revolves around him. You see, but we understand that everything the father does, listen carefully, everything the father does, how he does what he does, why he does what he does, listen carefully, has you and I in view. So in other words, it is for our benefits. You see, it is for our benefits. All right, the reason why at certain time, at certain seasons of your life, the father, all right, rather than, you know, communicate his will to you, all right, directly as it were into your spirit and you picking it up by your, you know, spiritual equipment of intuition, you see, rather than do that, there are certain times, certain seasons, certain, you know, places in our lives where the father will choose to communicate his will to us via the ministry of angels. You see, now one thing I found out, all right, from scriptures and from experience is that it is one of the father's way of ensuring that we become properly familiarized with his kingdom. It is one of the father's way of ensuring, all right, that we inherit the kingdom, all right? We inherit the kingdom. So he sees to it, the father sees to it, all right, that every, every, you know, uh, um, uh, um, divine, you know, instrumentality, all right, by which the kingdom, his kingdom is composed, by which his kingdom is, you know, uh, is, 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 is constituted, all right, uh, you know, we become exposed to them. We become exposed to them. We become exposed to all of the, you know, divine instrumentality by which the kingdom of God is composed. So you don't tell God this, how he should lead you. Yes, that's one of the reasons why you have the scriptures. You see, the scripture is full of the experiences people had in God, people had with God to show you something, to show you something. You see, to show you something. But you see, how you now interpret how you now interpret these events in scriptures, all right, is majorly, largely dependent on you. Because sometimes you can see an event in scriptures and give it a false interpretation, give it a wrong interpretation. You see, give it a wrong interpretation. Like I said, some persons will believe, for example, when you talk about the subject of angels, they believe, for example, that angels is Old Testament. The ministry of angels that is not New Testament. The New Testament is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You wonder. Some people just run off, you know, run off and arrive at a theological standpoint, a theological view, all right, on by one scripture, just on the basis of just one scripture, one statement, just one statement. They just quickly run off and arrive at a theological viewpoint, you know, theological view, viewpoint. I remember years back, I asked someone years back, you know, why he believed so. The scripture he could provide was 2 Corinthians 3, you know, in when Paul was making, you know, a distinction between the law, all right, you know, and, 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 and you know, in called the new covenant, all right, where he refers to the new covenant as the ministration of the spirit, you see, the ministration of life, 
all right? But the old covenant he refers to as the ministration of death, of condemnation, you see? So that's the administration of the spirit. So he just concluded that the mission of the spirit there is Holy Spirit, is Holy Spirit. That was his conclusion and, you know, Now, so I'll quickly say something. Now, I'm sure we remember that at the very beginning of this series, we had established the fact that we are not discussing the subject of angels with a view to, you know, looking at everything about angels the hierarchy the categories you know no 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 we're not doing that all right rather we are looking at the subject of angels with a view to you know you know um raising the awareness of deliverance again all right to the ministries of angels all right also with a view to you know opening up the different areas you know different aspects of the life of the believer to the involvement of angels you see to the involvement of angels so and i said that to say this so keep that in view so what we are saying now about angels being part of the divine instrument by which the father furnishes the believer with directions with leadings with instructions all right is also with this in view you see now one of the things we've seen you know which you know a while back, the father, you know, the Lord showed me is the fact that many believers have had angelic, you know, um, um, interventions in their lives that because they were not in quote into angels. Have you heard people say that I'm not into angels because they were in quote not into angels? They have missed major opportunities, all right, to transition appropriately. They had missed major instructions. That they could have acted upon and have, and would have taken their lives all right you know into you know directions determined preordained of god you see it is also the reasons why we have lots of believers who are unintelligent all right in their ability to you know receive and respond to angelic ministries all right it's one of the reasons why you see believers. You see believers who would, um, in quote, you know, become aware of movements in their rooms. You see, now the major part of that. Now that number is reducing, and it will, it will reduce, all right, to a complete zero, all right. The, but the major part of believers, all right, would usually and normally think such movement to be demons. You see, so we have lots of believers who are more demon conscious. They are more demon responsive than they are angel conscious than they are angel responsive you see they are quick they have an antenna that is quick all right is quick to interpret movements around them to be demons you see and they've developed a response mindset a negative response mindset mindset as a matter of fact you see now there are other groups of believers who can tell that oh i felt the movement in my room i felt the movement around me i knew that it was i knew it was an angel or they were angels but you see that is as much as this other group go you see but the number of believers all right who go beyond being aware that these movements are movements of angels to re accurately responding so that the ministries can be received a few you see and the father doesn't want that you see because you see over time they have been major directions major opportunities major opportunities all right for god's kingdom to win that have been lost you see major opportunities for you know very important instructions to be received and acted upon that have been lost that have been lost you see 
Now, this is one of the reasons why, you know, in the last session, we began to look, you know, you know, at the difference, all right? I'm sure we remember, at the difference that exists between how God speaks, when he speaks, all right? And how, you know, angels speak, when they speak, or should I say, how our hearts perceive, all right, the words of God, the voice of God, all right, when the Father speaks, and how our heart, all right, perceives the words of the angel when they speak. It's important to be able to tell this difference. It's important. Someone is wondering, okay, so why should I be able to tell the difference? You should be able to, all right? It is one, like we said earlier, it is one of the proof, all right, of authentic maturity. It is one of the proof of authentic development in the kingdom to be able to distinguish. You see, isn't that what is expected of every, every natural child? To be able to tell the difference. You see, to be able to tell the difference between hot and cold, between sweet and bitter, between light and darkness. You see, between a low tone and a high tone, low volume, you know, it's one of the proof that the child is maturing. You see, the fact that the child is able to use its senses, you see, to interact with the environment around him, its senses, you see, is the same thing for you in the kingdom. One of the proof of authentic spiritual maturity is your, your ability to be able to tell the difference, to be able to use your senses, your spiritual senses now, all right? The senses of your heart, you see? both of your soul and your spirit, these two make up your heart. To be able to use your senses to tell, to distinguish, to relate, to react, to respond to divine things intelligently, intelligently. You see, it's amazing how you see believers who tell you it doesn't matter. But yet, to these same believers, it matters that their children, their babies, are able to tell their father's voice from their mother's voice. It's important to them that they are babies. No, now do you know how awkward you would feel when you see your child, your child put his bare hands into a hot boiling water and doesn't feel a thing. And the skin of the hand is peeling off. No, you know there's a problem. You know there's a problem. Or when you see a child, you bring a loud music close to a child's ear and the child is just there. It's not, it's not you know, doing this. No, you know there's a problem. You quickly can tell that something is wrong with the child. But you see, you know, believers, not able to tell the difference and they tell you, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, it's just, just listen to the Holy Spirit. Yes. It is the same Holy Spirit, all right, that takes the responsibility of exposing to our hearts, you see, the, the, the different, you know, compartments that exist in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus said to us in the book of John, all right, that all that the Father had are mine. Do you understand that? All he says, all that the Father had are mine. Then he goes on to say, therefore say I unto you that he, the spirit of truth, all right, shall take of what is mine and reveal it to you. Reveal means to shine the light upon, to expose, to cause you to become familiarized with. So you see, the Holy Spirit, he says, the spirit of truth, he says, shall take of what is his, that is what is Jesus's, all right, which he says are all that the Father has, all right, and reveal, expose to us. You see, he will expose them to us. You see, and one of the least constitution of all that the Father has that makes up the kingdom of God, all right, are or is the ministries of angels. Is the ministries of angels. In fact, I dare say this. If the believer, if the believer finds it difficult, listen carefully, if the believer finds it difficult to receive the ministry of the angels, to be able to respond in telling to the, intelligently to the ministry of the angels, all right, listen carefully. If he finds it difficult or impossible to, they are 
operations of the kingdom, there are operations of the kingdom a believer will not be able to respond to. I'm telling you. I'll say that again. <laughs> you see, because you see, how the father, the father's plan to have the believer exposed to the activities of the angels, all right, is actually, all right, it actually has an end in view, all right? An end in view that is clustered. In other words, there are different reasons that make up the end to why the father sees to it that as a believer, you're exposed to the ministry of angels. So there are certain operations of the kingdom. Listen, there are certain operations of the kingdom. The believer will find them possible to, you know, appropriate. You see, they are yours. They are your inheritance, you see. But you see, what is yours, all right? What exists in God as yours, all right? Is yours. And as such, there is an inheriting of that which is yours. That is why Paul himself talks about inheriting the kingdom. You see, inheriting the kingdom. In Galatians, it says, those that walk in the flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, all right, in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, it says, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So there is an inheriting of the kingdom. Now, mind you, he was talking to saints, new creation folks, faith people, Holy Ghost speaking, gift operating people. So he says to them, there is such a thing as inheriting. It's yours. Now, inheriting there speak, doesn't, speak, doesn't speak of just going to heaven. Inheriting there speaks of appropriating what is yours. You see, coming into the possession of what is yours, coming into the practical, tangible interaction of what is yours. You see, and the inheriting of the kingdom, all right, begins now, it's here. No, it's not when you get to heaven. No, it's here. It's here, all right? That process of inheriting began as soon as you came alive to God. As soon as you became awakened to God. As soon as you became indwelt by his spirit. The inheriting of the kingdom began then. So the inheriting of the kingdom is not a future thing, no. So there are realities of the kingdom that the believer will not be able to. Now, it's not the father not given. No, it is the believer lacking the equipment. Oh, yes. Lacking the equipment to relate, to interact with this reality of the kingdom. Because you see, there are equipment of your spirit that becomes sharpened. You see, the equipment of your spirit that are activated, all right, on account of your appropriating setting operations of the kingdom. So in other words now, appropriating setting operations of the kingdom, all right, unlocks the equipment of your spirit to appropriate other operations of the kingdom. You see, so one of such is the ministries of angels. There is a way that becoming familiar with the ministry of angels, all right, unlocks, you know, you know the equipment in your heart activates, expands your heart in such a way that you are able to appropriate. You are able to appropriate. You see, you are able to come into the divine interactions of other, you know, operations, realities in the kingdom. You see. Oh, glory to Jesus. Forever. Now, when you look at the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, you will see that there are divine realities of God. All right? Don't forget Jesus said in chapter 16, he says, all that the Father have are mine. Now, there are divine realities of God. Now, one good example is, one good place to see this, see this play out, is in the book of Revelation. You will see that they, in the book of Revelation, they are setting, they are setting operations of God that angelic personalities were instrumental in drawing John's attention to them. 
angelic personality were instrumental in, as it were, activating John into seeing this. Now, don't forget, the book of Revelation is in your New Testament. Is in your New Testament. So don't be quick to say, no, that's Old Testament. In your New Testament, there are certain operations, all right, of God that the living creatures, all right, opened up to John. That angels were instrumental in declaring. It's in your book of Revelations. There are certain things angels declared. There are certain things angels brought John into. They helped John to see, to gain sight of. And don't forget, now, I don't know if you've been participating in, um, uh, there's an ongoing series we've been doing, all right? We, we, it's actually um, some kind of a continuation of, um, you know, um, a, 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 a conference we had held in January ending, January ending, all right? We call it Kingdom Priesthood. Now, it's, it was a four days uh, um, meeting, all right? Where we, you know, we're laying foundation to kingdom priesthood. All right. Now, um, because we didn't go as far as you know we are taught we would, you know, at the, at the time we said we're going to have another session. All right. But what we've been doing, you know, now, you know, as led by God, is that we have begun to touch it again. I've been doing that in our Sunday meetings. Now the messages are available online. All right. So you may want to have them downloaded and just um, and just um, be blessed. All right. And you know, of course, you have to be further enlarged. Now, during this series, or right, particularly in the last Sunday's series, now we repeated now because there's something we've been saying, we've been pointing out this, all right, for since last year about the book of Revelation. All right. Now, and that is that the book of Revelation is not a book about the future. You see, the book of Revelation is not a book that speaks of the future. You see. The book of Revelation captures, you see, it is called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ for a reason. The book of Re Revelation actually captures, all right, the progressive movement, you see, of the believer into full stature. The book of Revelation is not a book about the Antichrist. It's not a book about Babylon. You see, it's about, a, it's a book that captures the pathways all right, for the progressive movement of the believer. It captures the pathways of the progressive movement of the believer, all right, into full stature. So when you read that book, listen carefully, when you read that book, you must understand, you must read that book with this in view. In fact, I dare say that the book of Revelation, all right, captures the whole book of the Bible, Genesis down to the book before the book of Revelation. That's the book of Jude. It captures all, 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 all. That is also the reason why we also said in the ongoing teaching series on priesthood, that book of Revelation is not even a prophetic book. You see, the frequency of communication, all right, of that book, all right, is at a level superior to the prophetic, all right? It is priestly, it is priesthood. It is priestly, it is priesthood. So you may want to get the previous series and listen to the man. You may want to join in, all right, tomorrow. Tomorrow the series continues. Now, I said that to say this. Listen carefully. If you look at the book of Revelation, that describes, listen, that captures the pathways of your progressive movement. You see, your progressive movement into all that you are, that Christ is. You will see that in that map, there are activities of angels in it. There were mysteries of God. There were operations of God, or there are operations of God. You see, in that book of Revelation, that angelic personalities, you see, that the elders, you see, that the living creatures, you see, that saints, you see, are instrumental in opening so what that means is that when you look at Revelation, you are seeing things, oh dear Jesus, you are seeing operations. You will need to, you know, experience. You will need to pass through. Operations you will need to be baptized in, immersed in, you see, on your path to, to evolve in, you see, 
on your path to coming into all that you already are. So you see, every time book of Revelation, you see an angel speak. You see it, uh, one of the 24 elders speak. You see, what you are saying is each of them represent categories. Each of them are a representation. So you see, when that elder spoke, he was a representation of the 24 elders. Hmm. You see, which is an indication of operations in God you will not be able to come into as a believer, all right, without the signature, you see, of the ministries of the elders. Where the living creature spoke, all right, is an indication of the signature, all right, of the ministries of the living creatures, you see, without which you will not be able to come into some things in God. Where certain angels spoke, you see, where certain saints spoke, so the book of Revelation is about you. It's about you. It's about you. That is the reason why before John, for John to come into that, to come into that complete, to have that complete, robust vision, all right? As it relates to the believer, as it relates to the man in God, the man in Christ, all right? John was first taken to before the creation of the first man. That is what you see in Revelation chapter 4, when he was to come up here, and I will show you things that will take place shortly. John was taken up, and immediately he was translated to the point in time, even before the creation of man. That is what you see in Revelation chapter 4. Get the teaching and listen to them. It will bless you. It will expand and explode your heart. Revelation 4 captures, captures, begins with the capturing of proceedings in the throne before the creation of the first man. And yet, what was the, do you notice, what was the invitation? Come up here, and I will show you things that will take place shortly. One transition says, another transition says, come up here, and I will show you things that will take place hereafter. Hereafter. Can you imagine that? And yet, he was taken to where? You see, so to have, oh dear Jesus, I love this, all right? But let me stop here so I don't, I'm not telling to begin to teach on priesthood. Now, you know, there's a way I feel, it triggers, you know, this holy joy. Oh, glory to God, forever. So you see, it's important that we understand that. So you don't say, no, and no, no, it's, you didn't write the scriptures. So it's not a question of what you believe, what you want to agree with. No. <laughs> it's scripture. All right? All right? Brought forth like the scripture, like Paul put it. See, all scripture is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You didn't write it. So you have no, you have no right to choose what to believe from the scripture and not what to believe. You don't have any right. The only right you have is to receive <laughs> The whole counsel of God, as Paul put it. The only right you have is to receive. You don't have any right to choose. You don't choose. Like some people do. We don't, we don't agree with this doctrine. We don't, no, no, of course, you have a right to agree or not to agree with the doctrines of men. But you don't have any right to disagree, disapprove, or approve, you see, of the doctrines of God, the doctrines of Christ. You see? What we call doctrines are not just mere teachings. They're not just teaching, you know, you know, you know, summons. They're not just belief systems. You see, doctrines are a reflection, you see, of eternal operations. Doctrines are a reflection of eternal movements. Doctrines are a reflection, all right, of places in eternity, operations in eternity. You see, so when you're listening to the doctrines of God, all right, you're not just hearing teachings. You're not just hearing words. You're not just hearing a discussion of a particular Bible topic. No. The communication of the doctrines of God, all right, to you becomes what, an opportunity for you to experience places in God, to experience an operation in God, to, you know, come into an operation in God, to step through. You see? Into places, existences, spheres of habitations in God. You see? You 
You see, that's what the doctrines of God are. They are a pointer to actual places, actual realms, actual dimensions in God. Glory to Jesus forever and ever. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. All right. Now, so very quickly, we um, highlight again. All right. We touched on in the last session, we touched on the difference that exists between, you know, um, how our heart, you know, um, receives, responds, and reacts, as it were to the to the words of god to the voice of god as against how our heart you know perceives receives you know response you know filters um the speakings of angels now we said angels speak they speak angels can speak now some people you know you, it's amazing when people argue with that when people now, the same people don't doubt, don't have a doubt, the least doubt, all right, about demons speaking to people. They believe in demons, that demons can talk, demons talk to people. But when you say angels speak, like, and yeah, these things are in scriptures. They're in scriptures, and they've been written for examples, the scripture says. You see? So angels speak. They speak. You see, angels speak. They have the right to speak to us. You are in the kingdom now, so they have the right to speak to you. So it's important that the believer, all right, comes to the place where he's able to distinguish, where he's able to tell. You see, because sometimes, sometimes angels will not speak to you if they do not get your attention. You see, angels will not speak to you if they do not get your attention. You see, I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is this, listen carefully. One of the reasons is this, Ange you know, is this, um, in comparison to how God speaks, all right, the communication that comes through angels can be more easily lost, all right, in comparison to you know, the speakings of God. And now remember that in the last session, we had said that the way God, the, the Lord speaks to us is in a way that reverberates, all right, within our being, all right? And I was using an illustration between how Jesus in a tangible physical manifestation speaks, all right? And how an angel in a tangible physical manifestation speaks. I'm sure we remember that, all right? You may have to go back and listen to the last session if, if you're not here. All right, it's, it's uploaded. All right, now, so, now, but you see, whether or not, whether or not you have a tangible physical manifestation of Jesus in the room, right in front of you, all right, he speaks to us in a way that filters through, you know, the corridors of our heart. You see, that filters through the corridors of our heart. You see, with 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 um, um, with little 
you know, a, a concentration as it were. You can hear God. You can, you can perceive him. You can. You see, but with angels, it's not like that. It's not like that. Hence why angels, listen, hence why angels, all right, are prone or have a way of um, getting your attention first before they speak. You see, because they know they are not God. And they know, amongst other things, that they, they do not speak to you the way God speaks to you, all right? They know they do not speak to you. For example, one of the major characteristics of how the Father speaks to us, like I said, is in a way that what? We're able to receive his speakings within us, all right? And angels do not have the privilege of indwelling believers. Angels do not have the privilege of dwelling within believers. They don't have that privilege. You see, angels do not have that privilege of, you know, um, of speaking within believers. So that's why when you look at the scriptures, when you look at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, you see how that angels spoke to people in ways that commanded their attention first. Command their attention. I'll give you an example. One good, exa one good example now is Daniel. Remember Daniel? Daniel was having an experience, all right, with an angel. And notice what the angel said. That sounded very stern. The angel said to him, he said, stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. He said, for to give this skill and wisdom, once it's a revelation and insight, have I not been sent to you? You see, the angel said, stand up on your feet, for to give you wisdom and revelation. Once a revelation, understanding, have I not been sent? Now, why didn't the, the angel, now why John, sorry, Daniel, was you know, on his face, as it were, on all fours, as it were, you know, being overpowered by the majestic glory exuding from this personality, this being. Why didn't this being just go ahead and speak? Rather, he said, say, get up on your feet. Get up on your feet. You see? Now, other places in scripture, you see the same play out, but not in the exact same way, but in principle. Angels, you know, gaining attention first for them to speak. You see, gaining attention first for them to speak. Now, listen, folks, it is one of the reasons why, it is one of the reasons why, you know, um, 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 you would feel movement in your room. You will feel movement in your room. Now, this has happened to many people. You will feel movement around you. Now, angels love to do that, to gain your attention. You see, to bring you in the place of, um, you know, tuning in, tuning in, of tuning in. You see, sometimes they have a way, you know, in Judah, sometimes they will touch you. Listen, folks, we are talking kingdom right now. They will touch you. You see, they could hit you, no, tap you. You see, but you see, God, on the other hand, doesn't need to tap you. For example, for example, the father wants to speak to you, all right? The father wants to speak to you, for example, all right? Now, notice, we are actually using the language of men to capture these things, all right? Now, for example, the Lord wants to speak to you. You are sleeping. The Lord does not need to wake you up to speak to you, all right? He can just speak to you right there, right there in your sleep, and it will feel time to your heart. But angels, on the other hand, all right, except for times when they can manifest. Angels can manifest to you in your dream, except for that. But angels, on the other hand, would tap you. They would tap you. You wake up from sleep, all right? Or they shake the bed. You wake up, you see? Or they would create movements in the room to jolt you up. You see? It's important we understand this. Is now, now a certain story comes to my mind now. A story told by um, by um, 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 Papa Kenneth he Higgin, all right, who is currently in heaven right now, all right, all right. He told a story in one of his books. I just remembered now of a certain time when he had been ministering. He had been having meetings, all right, morning session, evening session. So in between the session, he will go into his trailer house, all right, to rest, you know, to catch some rest before the evening session, before the next session. All right, 
Now, so said this certain day, he had gone into the trailer house, or as usual, to catch some rest before the next session where he'll be teaching again. Now, so while he was in the sleeping area of the trailer house, he began hearing movement. All right. But first, he was too tired to, you know, go check it out. But the movement, the activities in the sitting area of the trailer house continued. So by the time he got up, he says, to go check what was going on. All right. On getting there, he saw an angel leaving. You see, he saw an angel leaving. So at that point, he began to pray in tongues and began to, it was late. It was late. The angel was gone. Now, he went on to say that it was not until about a year after that event, when he was taking out time to pray, you know, to seek the Lord for the next direction for ministry and, and all of that, that the Lord Jesus, all right, on one of the days of praying, you know, manifested to him. Now, he said, when the Lord Jesus appeared and, you know, began speaking to him, the Lord Jesus had an angel beside him, all right? And as G the Lord Jesus spoke to him, all right, he was paying attention. He said, but from time to time, when he would take his gaze off of the Lord to look towards the angel, the angel would commence to want to speak, would, you know, begin to want to speak. Then he would take his gaze off of the angel and set it back on the Lord. Until when he perceived the Lord was done speaking, he now said to the Lord, what does this angel, what does he want to say? What does he want to say that if I look at him, he wants to say something. Then the Lord said to him, listen to him. For he has a message for you. Then he said in that experience, he told the Lord, Lord, since you are here, why don't you just tell me? Okay, do you get that? Why don't you just tell me? And the Lord said, listen to me. Here's the message for you. Now, it was by the time that the angel began to speak to him, the angel made him know, or he realized, that that was the same angel that had appeared to him a year before. And the message the angel was giving to him now, all right, contained directions, new directions for ministry that were supposed to have been communicated to him a year before, which he missed. So in other words, if he had responded to the administration of that angel a year before, all right, by now he'll be one year long gone in that new direction for ministry. One year long gone. But because he didn't respond appropriately to the ministry of angel, what happened? He was one year behind. One year behind. One year behind. Okay, someone is asking, or uh, he said, uh, um, I thought angels could speak to us in our dreams. Yes, I said so. Angels can. That's what I said, that, except when they manifest to you in your dreams. All right, but you see, even in your dreams, all right, it is characteristic of angels. They will gain your attention. They will draw your attention. They will draw your attention, all right? So the same thing applies, whether it's in dream, in your dream, or when in your you know, waking moment, doesn't matter. It is characteristic of angels, all right? They bring forth their ministry in a way that draws your attention. You know, we're speaking to you, we're communicating the counsel of God, where, you know, it's concerned, all right? Where it's concerned. You see, but you see also, you do not have to wait. You do not have to wait to see angels in dreams for you to receive major instructions. You do not have to wait. You see, to go to sleep before you receive major instructions. You see, whether you are asleep or you're awake, all right, it's important to tune your spiritual antenna to the point where what you're able to distinguish, all right, and by extension, receive, receive the ministries of angels. Receive the ministries of angels. Now, something that the Lord, all right, said to me, all right, sometimes back, which is um, one of the reasons for this series. In fact, it was while we were already having this series, it, the Lord, you know, reminded me again and spoke it again to me, all right. And it has to do with the increasing activities of angels today. There will be increasing activities of angels today. Now we understand that the ministry of angels is fundamental, all right, is a fundamental supply available to every believer in the kingdom. 
But there's just something about the will of God. There's something about the purpose and the plan of God today, all right, that amongst other things is triggering, is triggering an increase, all right, of the activities or in the ministries of angels. Triggering an increase, you see, of the ministry of angels. You see, that is also one of the reasons why. And I remember that in some weeks back, we were having a meeting and, you know, as we, sh as we shared, all right, you know, the Lord gave us a word by prophecy, all right, about angels, all right, becoming instrumental in facilitating trainings of believers, activating of believers into operations, divine operations, operations of glory, kingdom operations of glory. You see, certain things, certain Certain understandings of the kingdom that ordinarily would take time to communicate, that would take time to teach. All right, angels will be instrumental in facilitating activations where believers will supernaturally gain intelligence. You see, we gain understanding, you see, of very special, unique operations of the kingdom via the ministries of angels. You see, so the Lord began to point out the importance of believers, you see, intelligently responding, appropriately responding to angelic ministries. Now, you know what can happen when an angel begins to manifest in your room, all right, to facilitate an impartation, and you respond wrongly. You know what can be lost? Like, if somebody just hides, like, they die back, can it hear again? One year behind. One year behind. You see, he lost a major opportunity to step into God's plan, which, listen, which one year after he was having to be taking time to be fasting and praying, you see, for that direction to come again. And it came again through an angel. And the angel said to him that he was the same angel that had come a year before. A year before. You see, that year before he wasn't praying, he was just preaching. In fact, he was busy. So he wasn't fasting specially. So do you understand that? Learn from that. There are certain things that can come to you easily. Easily on the grounds of being what? On the grounds of gaining intelligence, gaining understanding. Just come to you easily. You see, it's better those kind of things come to you easily than for you to be fasting and praying long for them. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There are certain things that will come to you on the ground of what? Accurate intelligence. Because a lot of times, the things we pray and fast for, all right, when we fast and pray, that fasting and praying, first of all, creates an effect of heightening our awareness, creates an effect of increasing our consciousness, which in turn leads to what? You know, receiving God, you know, the word of God for specific area or receiving certain specific impartations. You see? Glory to God. Forever. So it's important, listen carefully, it is important that as believers who, who, who understand their righteousness position in God, all right, it's important that you become less conscious of demons. You come to a place where you are never conscious of demons. No, not conscious of demons. That is, you know, some of the people, when people say things like, oh, let's be careful so that you don't become demon possessed. That, that, that is the reason for foundational teaching. When people are taught the truth of their oneness with God, when they are taught the truth of their justification by faith, when they are taught the truth of their righteousness standing with God, until they come to a place in their heart, you see, where they treat Satan with disdain, with disregard, disregard. I tell people, Satan manifest, deal with him. Put him in his place and move on. Don't build a ministry around Satan. Don't build a ministry around Satan. You see, in fact, I tell people, don't build, don't build a measure for your spiritual stalwartness on how much of the demons you're able to deal with. Don't. How much of demons you're able to cast out? How many sick persons you're able to heal? Don't. Oh. It's a matter you understand this. 
rather through spiritual measure ought to be determined by how much of God you are able to handle in your heart. You see, like Paul puts it, he said that you in his prayer for the church, say that you and I will be able to comprehend, comprehend with all saints. What is the length and breadth, depth and height? You see, the length and breadth, depth and height does not have Satan, his works in view. Does not have Satan and his works in view. You want to brag, you want to boast, boast from the place of how much of God your heart is able to grasp. Don't boast on how much of demons and the works of Satan you're able to demolish. No. Jesus said that to the disciples. When they came back, said, Master, for the demons bowed to us in your name. He said, do not rejoice that they bow to you. Rather rejoice because what your names are written. That means he said that the basis of your rejoicing should be relationship with God. The basis of your rejoicing should not be demons being cast out, sick being healed, diseased body being what? Restored. The basis of your rejoicing should be what? Centered on the fact that what? You have a relationship with God. That is what it meant by rejoice that your names are written. So that should be the basis of your rejoicing. How much of God your heart increasingly is able to grasp, is able to comprehend in length and breadth, in depth and height. That should be the basis of your rejoicing. The basis of your rejoicing shouldn't be in the casting out of devils. It's good. Set people free. Exercise your righteousness where that is concerned. But you see, the true end of our righteousness is to be able to handle God. Yes. The true end of our righteousness is not to be able to cast out devils. It is to be able to handle God, to be able to fathom him. You see, to be able to transverse God, length and breadth, depth and height. That is the true end. You see, of your righteousness, of my righteousness. Glory to Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory. Glory. Now, this, this is so important. It's more than we understand this. You know, a lot of times in the church, we, we pray, you know, in our songs, in our, in our prayers, even in our teachings, you know, we, 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 we declare our desires to come into greater understanding of God, to come into greater operations of the kingdom. You know, we preach it. We preach of the depth of the kingdom. We, you know, we have lingos for it. We have terminologies for it. But you see, at the end of the day, it falls back to what the practical processes. You see, and as far as coming into greater understanding, greater work in the kingdom is concerned, the ministry of angels is one of the instrumentality by which the Father ensures that. You see, the ministry of angels is one of the instrumentality by which the Father ensures that. That is what you see in the book of Revelation. Don't forget what we said earlier about the book of Revelation. That's what you see in the book of Revelation. All right. So the book of Revelation, all right, is the pathways, contains the pathways, all right, for your progressive movement into God. And at different boundaries, you see, at different junction, you see, of these, your pathways, all right, of ascension into God, you have ministries of what? Of kingdom deans, ministries of divine personalities, all right, the elders, the living creatures, angels, and saints. You see, you see, you see operations of the tree of life, operations of the, the river of life scattered throughout, scattered throughout. You see, you see, you see operations necessitating what? 
you know, traveling back in time, going back in future. That's one. You see operations of stepping out completely out of time. All right. Whether past, present or future, you step out of it. All right. Into the endlessness of eternity. And in the same book of Revelation, you see a stepping out completely of time, out completely of eternity. All right. Into the very point. You see where God is, where God was long before eternity itself broke out. All in the book of Revelation. All right? All in the book of Revelation. See, that book we said is a map that captures the trajectory of your movement, the movement of your ascensions, your progressions into God. And you see, you see beings, you see these operations there. Glory. Glory to Jesus. Glory, glory, glory to God. Whew. Glory to God. All right. So, so when we make our desires known to the Lord, now some persons just think we make it known to the Lord, the Lord will just do it. Yes, He will do it. All right. And it's not going to do it because you're desiring it, all right? It will do it because those things are contained in our curriculum of learning, in our curriculum, you see, of being brought to the place of the stature of the perfect man. You see, they're contained there. But also, it's important to understand that what the Father will do, all right, will also necessitate our intelligent participations. For example, there are certain things the Father intends to do that will require, amongst other things, that you gain intelligence of about the ministry of angels, or that you come to a place of intelligently responding to the ministry of angels. It is part of the Father's plans. It is in the Father's plan for you, for me. It's in the Father's plan. It is contained in the kingdom curriculum. You see? the kingdom curriculum, you see, for you. So angels, see, just listen, angels are a part of your life. You see, angels are a part of your life. You, it's important as believers, we just, just settle that. As believers, it's important that that is settled. So rather than being in the place where, you know, one is arguing, So what, rather than, you know, being in the place where one is arguing about angels, just settle for it. Just, it's important, rather than begin to argue that, begin to train your heart to intelligently discern them and, and walk with them and receive the ministries of your father. Receive the workings of your father. To do otherwise is to walk in pride. To do otherwise is to walk in pride. Now, someone is asking a question. He said, um... Do angels only come around certain watches? Do angels only come around around certain watches? Now, um, let me say this at this point, all right? It is important, folks. Listen, everyone. It is important that um, we understand some very important things. Now, one of which is um, be, be, be careful of certain kinds of teachings. You see, there are, certain, there are certain kinds of teachings. Now, listen, listen, let me say some, something at this point in time. You see, any teaching, it doesn't matter how deep it sounds. It doesn't matter how high it takes you. Listen, if it lacks, if it lacks that characteristic wiring, that fundamental characterization, you see, of the grace of God in Christ Jesus, avoid it. Avoid it. You see. Now I said this because of this question. You see, angels do not only appear or manifest at certain watches. No, no. You know, sometimes when in the past, when in teaching by the struggle, we we'll begin to address this. And some people think, you know, that I personally David Edwards is controversial. No, any teaching that we take from the saint, what is theirs? 
We have a responsibility to come at it and sh shred it, scatter it to pieces. Angels do not come to you only at certain watches. Now, please listen, listen, listen. The manifestation of angels to believers is not subjected to certain times. Not at all, not at all, not at all. Now, if you believe that, what do you say about the angels assigned to you? The angels that are the basic, you know, general, you know, angels assigned to you. They are with you every time. And, you know, in fact, with the angels assigned to you, all right, as, you're, as you increase in your spiritual awareness, you can gain sight of them. You can perceive, you can become aware of their movement. And that isn't subject to setting watches. It isn't subject to setting watches. You see? But that, that's on one hand. On the other hand, yes, there are certain times, listen carefully, there are certain times, all right, when angels, when ministries of angels can manifest in your life. And number one, these certain times have to do with the seasons of God in your life. Sometimes at certain times where you are changing seasons, all right, angels are instrumental in bringing the impartation of the counsel of God for that new season. You see, so the manifestation of angels around those times of your life, you see, is not the definition for how angels manifest. You see, it is just that you are at, you are at a junction, you are at a transition point. And as such, angels were instrumental in aiding your transitioning from one season to another season. But that does not become a doctrine, you know, or a teaching, you see, for how and when angels manifest. No. 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 Not at all. You know, I remember a time I was, I was talking with some folks, all right? Let me start this example now. I was talking with some folks, okay? Now, while talking with them, One of them, a younger person, all right, who was amongst them, said to me, said, so, oh, really? And I was talking about angels. And the person said, oh, really? Now, she said, really? And she said, so, can you can you see my angels? Now, I don't do that every time people say that, all right? A lot of people have said that, all right? Now, but this person said, can you, so, can you see my angel now? And listen, 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 please hear this, all right? As soon as she said, can you see my angels now? I said, yes. Now, when I said yes, I wasn't seeing an angel at that time. Someone said, so that means you lied. No, I didn't lie. As soon as she said, can you see my angels? I said, yes. But when I said this, I wasn't seeing at that time. But I said yes, you see, because I understand the principle. I said yes to trigger my senses. I said yes to stimulate my senses. You see, it's called the law of faith. You see, the operation of the law of faith colliding with other laws of the spirit. So you see, I use the law of faith to trigger the operation of other laws of the spirit. So when I said yes, I wasn't seeing. You see, but when I said yes, seconds after I said yes, all right, I tuned in, all right, and there it was. I saw these two big boys these two big boys standing by her, I knew they were assigned to her. Now listen carefully, listen carefully to this experience. Now, as I looked at them, as I looked at them, I began to, from looking at them, I began to see certain things on the angels that were interpretations of the young girl's callings. The young girl's callings. And guess what? As I began to say these things, seconds after, not immediately, seconds after, this young girl began to shed tears. She said, one of the reasons is this, all right? They had been at a meeting, all right? Where, you know, a minister had given her words, confirming something God had said to her about his plan for her life. And here was I, by looking at the angels and describing things on them. Now, I'm sorry, it's, it's difficult to explain that, you know, in words now, all right? Describing things, when I say things, I don't mean clothes, they were, all right? But, there was a way they were cladded, 
They were clad in ways that was a reflection that carried the unique call of God over that you know, young girl. You see, so as I began describing, she began shedding tears. You see, she began shedding tears. And also as I looked at the angels, I could see some of the things she had gone through. I could see, you know, as it were, pages, all right, of the past seasons of her life. And I told her, now, it was a unique experience because number one, amongst other things rather, it was an experience in which by this operation, by this operation, word of wisdom, the gift of word of wisdom and the gift of word of knowledge, you see, and prophecy broke out. That was what was going on. Just by looking at an angel, just by seeing an angel. You see, now I said this to say this, that was in subject to season. I saw that angel or these angels. You see, it's important we understand that. I know, I know, I know. You see, that's one of the reasons. Listen, folks, it's one of the reasons why you need to be careful of. Be careful to not um, make your experience the basis for doctrine. Now, right? I'm still responding to that question about do angels only appear at certain watches? Now, listen. Now, I know certain persons who have thought that are some persons who because they experience angelic invitation at certain times of the year. See, that's a problem. When you make your experience or the experience you have, all right, a foundation for doctrine. No, that's what happens. You know, that's what I actually personally have, I've heard, that's why I'm treating this question specially. I've heard certain ministers who have taught that, you know, who because they experience angelic manifestation at certain times of the year. So because they've so experienced angelic visitors those certain times of the year, they now have a way of what? Preparing towards such times. All right? They have a way of preparing towards such times. You see, there is a problem with that. And one of the problems with that is, is you develop, you will, such persons will develop a spiritual attitude, all right, that stagnates them, that, you know, brings them to a place where they are fixated, where the ministry of angels is concerned, they, are, they become fixated in attitude. All right, like probably the spirit of their mind. All right, they form a spirit of mind that limits their experience with angels to those times. You see, it's important. And it's one of the reasons why I usually say, when, see, you must be able to separate the, your experience in the kingdom all right, that you have, you see, for example, as a prophet from your limitless access to the same kingdom that you have as a child of God. You see, if you, you see, it's tempting. There's a way you can lock into the provisions of the kingdom that is accessible to you within the limits of the anointing on your life as a prophet or as an apostle, you know, as you know, as whatever. There's a way you can you can lock yourself, you see, and thereby shut yourself out, out from the limitlessness of the kingdom that is available to you as a child of God, as a son of God, as a kingdom person. You see, the availability of the kingdom to you as a child of God, as a kingdom person, all right, is limitless. Compared to what the provisions of the kingdom are available to you within the context of your anointing and your office. Whew. Glory to Jesus. Hmm. Glory, glory to Jesus. Hmm. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. All right, so a um, couple of more questions here. So we've answered that question. Do angels only come around certain watches? No. No.
Yes, yeah, somebody asked, somebody is asking a question, though sent as a direct message. It says, another question is, um, does cons, does con, pondering rather, does pondering on previous encounters, such as dreams, all right, with angels help increase our awareness? Oh, yes. Yes, we've, we've, we have a teaching series on that. All right, I think there was one, the first time we did a teaching on that, it's titled, um, 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 what's that now? How was it titled? Um, um, what's that now? Uh, remembrances, yes. Titled Remembrances, all right? And we drew that from scriptures. We drew that principle from scriptures, all right? All right, so yes, yes, yes. Um, I know that. Okay, somebody else says uh, you just answered my question. You heard my heart. Somebody else is saying. Um, okay, um, this question. Somebody says, how do we intelligently respond to the movement of angels in our rooms or around us? All right. Somebody else says, um, okay, I experience the manifestation of the angels often around certain location in my house. Could you give insight into why? Okay. Um, Oh, yes. Yes. Remembrance. That's the title of the message. Now, the two questions are the same. Now, um, now, number one, I think it was last, in the last session, we had established the fact that um, when it comes to the kingdom, it's important to put away spookiness, all right? We are not being spooky, acting weird. Now, people who act spooky, now we said the reason why people can be spooky and acting weird, carrying this weird look, you know, you know, of specialness and, you know, it's unnecessary. And one of the dangers of doing that is that it will expose such a person to familiar spirits, to familiar spirits, you see. So there is a simplicity to appropriating the realities of the kingdom. You see, there is a simplicity to it. There is, you know, no spookiness, no, 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 nothing, just simple. Now, in previous teachings, we have actually highlighted how to, for example, when you begin to become aware of movement, when you become aware of movement in your room, you know, movement of divine, you know, uh, and beings in your room, all right? It's, it's as simple as the principles we had highlighted, or rather the, the, the steps we had highlighted in previous teachings. Are we paying attention? All right. There are steps we had highlighted, okay? For example, when people become aware of demons, you know, what do they do? that triggers or that causes that manifestation to even increase in their room, fear. They respond in fear and fear has actions, right? Fear it's known, fear is just like faith. You see, fear it's known by its actions. Faith is known by its actions, okay? So one of the people doing fear is they speak their fear. Then they act their fear. They hide, they shrink, they draw back. You see, what about faith, all right? How you respond in faith. You speak it. All right. Describe what you're feeling. I, I can feel movement here. What's now? You're not talking because somebody, another human being is there. You're talking. You're, it's just you. So you can either say it out or you can begin to think it. Think to us. Speak to us what you are aware of. You can either think it or you can say it in the English language or in, you know, um, establishing your awareness of that movement, you can pray in the spirit, paying attention to that spot. You can pray in the spirit, all right? That's number one. Number two, still in connection to actions sponsored by faith or characteristic of faith, all right? Act towards it. You know, with a demon consciousness, people will be shrink, shrink away. No, get up. You were lying down. You felt the movement, get up. Getting up is proof that what? You honor this thing. You know it's there. Get up, get up, all right? Sometimes you may even need to get up and go to where it is, follow it. We call it follow the light, <laughs> follow it. Go to the place where that manifestation is, you know, you've sensed it. Go there, sit down. If you have to pace, praying in the spirit. You see, don't just become aware and just, you know, continue like praying in tongues on your bed with your, with your, with your cloth, you know, duvet covering you, no. That's not honor. You have to walk towards it. You have to walk towards it. You have to speak it. You have to speak it. 
All right. Then also, when your experience of that manifestation is like a flash, quickly, you didn't see, you didn't see it again. But see, can you remember the flash? What did the flash look like? All right. Set it in view. Set it in view. Set it in view. See, listen, folks, this is kingdom practice. This is kingdom practice. This is kingdom. Don't say, no, if God wants to meet your city, he will show me. No. No. This is you practicing. So that flash you saw, all right, it doesn't matter how small it may have been. Now, capture the flash and put it in view. Then pray in tongues around it. Pray in tongues around it. You see, do that for a while. Do that. Now, one of the things that happens is when you do this, you are activating your spiritual senses. You are quickening your heart's awareness. You see, this is very basic. Very, very basic. It's more than you understand this. So sometimes you may need to do this for a while. Now, when I say for a while, I don't mean for hour stretch, but for a period of days, period of weeks, you know, for a couple of weeks, couple of days, you do it, do it. So you do it for a while part time, all right? If nothing more seems to manifest, don't worry, go back to what you were doing. Because sometimes angels do this, all right, for a period of time, to prepare for a period of time. Sometimes they do this to quicken your sight. To quicken your sight. You see, now this, at this point, I want to say this. This is one of the reasons why it is important. Listen, folks. It is one of the reasons why it's important for you to practice these things. All right? In quote, long before you start becoming aware of movements in your house. You practice long before. It, it's easier, you know, in a sense, if you've been practicing this. You don't wait until you become aware of a presence, you know, for you to do this. You do this daily. Do this regularly. So that in the day and time and angels, all right, seizes a moment to manifest, materialize before you, all right? It does not when you now start, you get a picture. It is one of the reasons why we talk about practicing these things as a lifestyle, doing it as a lifestyle, all right? It's one of the reasons why we did lots of teachings around this. Lots of teachings around this. There are a lot of teachings we've done around this. Practice them, don't wait. Do it for a period of time, just do it. So that, you see, it's not when you start feeling divine movement. That's when you now want to do what? You now want to practice the opening of your sight. Do this regularly. If, for example, you had at any point been conscious or aware of a divine movement, all right, that you know you didn't get to, don't, don't, no, no, don't relax. Don't become discouraged. Now, between then and now, what have you been doing? Don't wait again until you feel movement tomorrow. No, get to this. Do it as a lifestyle. Do it as a lifestyle. You know, do it as a lifestyle. Let it be part of your daily discipline, you see, of fellowshipping with the Lord in tongues, in confessions, you know, in meditations. Let it be part of your daily discipline. Your daily discipline. Your daily discipline. Glory to God forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So, um, uh, two hours, you know, um, time for each of this conversation is uh, past. All right. It's past. So, um, we, we are going to be doing one more session, all right? We're going to be doing one more session, which will be next Saturday. Now, next Saturday is, um, I think, is the first. It's the first, first of May. So we're going to be doing one more session now. We don't know how long this will take. You know, we're going to do one more session. We're thinking of, you know, um, um, just taking the session for a while and just pause to create them for people to practice, all right? So it's not you know, a regular, you know, every Saturday morning meeting. No, we, 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 we latched onto it when we picked up that leading from the Lord. All right. So we're going to be doing one more session next 
Saturday. All right. So what that means is that um, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, is that we look out for another session. Is that we become expert on for another session. So what that also means is that um, after next Saturday we may not have another session for a while. All right. To give room for practice, we may not have another session on the conversation on angels for a while. All right. Maybe for another one month. We don't know. All right. We'll put that information out there again. All right. It's important we practice. It's important we practice. All right. But there are a couple of more things that we want to talk about. All right. Very important. We want to talk about on the conversation on angels. All right. So we're going to be doing that next um, Saturday. Next Saturday. So um, we will probably create other mediums for you know keeping the flow going, the, keeping the series on conversation on angels. You know going. You know. But next Saturday will. You know. Maybe, all right, all right, maybe our last session on the conversation on angels. So, um, you know, be on the lookout for, for conversation on angels again next Saturday, all right, 6 a.m. plus 1 GMT. So, grace is multiplied to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. sir. So much, and you can't leave reply. I love you this much. Your arms open wide, extended over across, then took my place and you died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 